Today's subject is perhaps the most mysterious and esoteric of the subjects that we have covered yet. We've spoken a lot about the afterlife, the soul, the reckoning and the judgment and what happens to the body in the grave, what happens to the soul in heaven after the two separate. We talked about paradise and purgatory. But now at long last, we are going to talk about reincarnation. Now, a a few disclaimers. Number one, this is a vast subject. There is voluminous literature on the subject. All of the literature is of Kabbalistic nature. There are no overt references to the subject of reincarnation in the non-Kabbalistic literature, though there may be some faint hints, allusions, suggestions, maybe even implications in the revealed non-Kabbalistic literature, but overt references are only in the Kabbalistic literature. And as I mentioned, it's vast, it's intricate, it's complex. That's disclaimer number one. Number two, even though I'm speaking about the subject, I am by no means an expert in any of these subjects. It's way over my head. But I will tell you that I did try to do assiduous research, and I really strove for accuracy, but I want to be upfront with y'all about my general ignorance in this subject. And disclaimer number three, what we're going to cover today is really barely scratching the surface of the subject. We're going to cover the main ideas, the main contours of the subject, but the details are myriad and quite complex. So if you think you're getting all there is out there, the truth is that what we're going to cover is far from it. Now, if this subject is so esoteric, so arcane, the question can be posed, what business do we have talking about it? If it's above us, if it's beyond us, if it's so Kabbalistic, why are we even broaching this subject? I think that's a fair question, and I have a few responses to that. Number one, it's really in our schedule. You know, we're talking about the 13 principles of faith, and we're in principle number 11, and that's about the afterlife and the reward and punishment of the afterlife. I don't think that we can get a true and accurate picture of the afterlife what happens after you die, and all the various different options, we cannot do that faithfully without this subject, number one. Number two, I think it's actually a much more central subject than we might imagine. We may think, you know, it's this idea, it's this spooky, esoteric idea. The truth is that it really touches on a lot of important subjects. It also resolves a lot of problems and questions that we have in our understanding of philosophy. And it's also going to prove to be a very helpful and beneficial subject to really build out our understanding of Torah philosophy. Moreover, this is a subject that people are really curious about. And I think it's well within our mandate to assemble what our sages say about it, and to try to provide a well-rounded overview of this subject. And finally, the sources maintain, perhaps surprisingly, that most of the souls extant in the world today are actually recycled souls. Only a minority are first-time souls. Thus, this is not just this theoretical study of reincarnation, The ramifications are very relevant to us, very practical to us, because they're going to be very illuminating about what we must strive and accomplish in our life. With those disclaimers aside, let's begin. Definitionally, reincarnation refers to the notion that the soul, in some capacity, in some form, in some context, in some way, comes back to this world after its departure from this world. This person dies, 
soul goes to heaven, and it is determined that this soul, in some capacity, in some form, in some context, in some way, is going to be sent back, that is, reincarnation. And we're going to try to approach this subject as we always strive to do, methodically, piece by piece, building from the ground up. And I want to start off with why. What is the reason why this idea exists? So the Ramchal, who has been very helpful in the past, in Derech Hashem, the way of God, this is section 2, chapter 3, paragraph 10. He tells us like this. The highest wisdom, i.e. God, arranged another thing to increase or to expand the salvation. And that is that the soul will come back many times back to this world in different bodies. In order to maximize the pool of candidates for the afterlife, for Olam Abba, for the ultimate goal, as we always remind you, the ultimate goal is Olam Abba. But in order to expand the pool of candidates, the Almighty provided this capacity for the soul to come back, come back to this world many times in many different bodies to be able to be eligible for Olam Abba. Once the soul comes back here, it can fix, says Ramchal, it can fix that that it damaged in a previous iteration, in a previous lifetime. It can rectify what was wrong, number one. Number two, it can complete that that it, not, that it did not complete in a previous go-round. So Ramchal is telling us that there's two reasons why a soul may be subjected to reincarnation. Number one, to fix, to rectify. If there's damage from a previous door round, it can come back to fix it. Number two, to complete that that is lacking. And the way he portrays it, bit picture, is very similar to the idea of Gehenom that we talked about in the past. Ganom, that's a venue through which rectification and cleansing is done. You know, ideally, someone doesn't do any sins. Next best is someone does a sin, but they repent and they cleanse the damage born to the soul due to that sin. They cleanse it when they're still here. Next best is they go to heaven and that can be cleansed in Gehenom. And then there's yet another option, reincarnation, come back, rectify and cleanse here again. And because there are so many opportunities to fix the damage, to rectify, to cleanse, that ensures that eligibility for Olam Abba is not just for the perfect, the flawless ones, the four flawless ones that we talked about in the past, someone who completely repented before they died, You don't have to be perfect to be eligible. You don't even have to be perfect enough to be able to be cleansed in Gehenna if someone comes to heaven and is found to be ineligible for paradise. They're not perfect. And even ineligible for Gehenna, such a person may be given yet another shot with reincarnation. And again, Ramchal tells us two distinct opportunities in reincarnation. Number one, to fix the damage done in previous cycles. Number two, to finish the mission, to complete that that is yet to be completed, to achieve the perfection that you must achieve. So there's the positive side and the negative side. On the positive side, to accomplish, to fulfill what you have yet to fulfill on the positive side, on the performative side. And then on the negative side, to rectify, to fix that that was damaged, perhaps via punishment as we learn, punishment cleanses, to fix what was damaged. Now it's important to note, the soul arrives to heaven and the soul is damaged. 
Some souls are going to be sent to Ganom. Other souls will be sent back via reincarnation. In both of these destinations, there's rectification, or at least the possibility of rectification. But there's a difference between reincarnation and Gehenna. For one, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, Gehenna cleanses. Rectification may cleanse. Not necessarily. Moreover, rectification is achieved in Gehenna and there's no possibility of exacerbation of damage in Gehenna. Whereas once someone is thrown back into this world, they're again in the realm of free will, there may be a further aggravation of the damage because they're back here and who knows what else they're going to do. Maybe they won't even fix what they damaged last time and maybe they may even make it worse with more sins in the second go-round or the fifth or the hundredth. Moreover, the cleansing in Gehenna is a little bit different than that of reincarnation. And this is courtesy of Rashis Chachma, the book that we've mentioned already two weeks in a row. Chapter 13. He says, why is there a need for Gilgal, for reincarnation, once there is the possibility of rectification in Gehenna? And he gives two answers. Number one, Gehenna can only remove stains, can only cleanse. And you remember, the Ramchal says that the purpose of reincarnation is twofold. A, to remove the stains. B, to accomplish performatively that that you did not accomplish. Gehenna is solely for cleansing. You cannot plug in any gaps. You cannot fulfill that that you did not fulfill. You cannot complete and achieve perfection. You cannot actively accomplish something. You could just remove the negative. That's Difference number one between Gehenna and reincarnation. Number two, there are degrees of damage to the soul that are cleansable in Gehenna. It's within the cleansing capacity of Gehenna to purify. But Gehenna does not have infinite cleansing capacity. And therefore, if someone has the kind of damage in their soul that's not dischargeable in Gehenna, then the only way it would be rectifiable is via reincarnation. So again, big picture, what do we have? Soul comes back. Why? We have two reasons. Hey, there are two. Number one, to accomplish something, to achieve perfection in an area that they have not yet done so. Number two, to cleanse and purify and purge the soul of its damage. Now, the Arizal, he, of course, is the greatest of the Kabbalists. And basically all that we know about this subject comes from him in his comprehensive treatment of the subject, a book called Shar Hadil Gulim, he adds a third reason why a soul may come back. And that is not for their own personal agenda, a soul that is not damaged, perfect, is not lacking, perfect. The soul may come to help others to guide them, and to help them fix themselves. So you don't have a soul that's perfect. Really? You go straight to paradise? But it may come back, or at least some aspect of that soul may come back, solely for the benefit of others. The soul itself, personally, is perfect, but it will be sent back down in order to help others 
perfect themselves. So if we had to give an accounting of this idea, reincarnation, we would say that there are three reasons, courtesy of our sages, why reincarnation exists, to accomplish what the person has yet to accomplish, this unfinished business, the mission has not been completed, the positive side, to fix the damage that was caused by the person in a previous lifetime, on the negative side, and thirdly, to help others accomplish what they need to accomplish and arrive at perfection. Let's go a little bit deeper. One of the reasons why reincarnation may be needed, we called it the positive side, that is when a person needs to accomplish what they have yet to accomplish. Arizel explains, a soul cannot be complete until it is a bearer of all 630 mitzvos. As we mentioned last week, the soul itself is comprised of 613 parts. Each one of them is nourished, is fed, is built spiritually by one of the 613 mitzvahs, by the corresponding mitzvah. In order for the soul to be complete, it must contain all 613. If the soul is missing 5 or 10, the soul may have to come back to plug in those gaps, to complete, to fulfill, to accomplish. There's also the idea that we know some mitzvos are unfulfillable. Some mitzvos are exclusively the domain of the Kohen or of, or of women, etc. So a person may come back in different ways as different entities to facilitate them completing all 613. And by the way, we'll talk more about this in a little bit. The person will be designed, engineered, positioned to gravitate towards the area that they need to complete. So if a person has like a magnetic attraction to a given mitzvah, they're just drawn to it. This is what they need to do. It may be because their soul knows that this is what is missing. This is the final puzzle piece. And the person is just compelled and propelled towards finding what they need to complete their their spiritual lives. Now, what is true with mitzvos is also true with Torah. Arizal says, every soul in order to be complete, must be a bearer, just like it must contain all 630 mitzvos, it must be a bearer of all of Torah. Every area of Torah, every dimension of Torah. And he explains, the Talmud tells us, the book of Avodah Zarah, page 19a, a person should always study that that their heart desires. If your heart is telling you, I need to study this part of Torah, That's what you should study. Why? Because perhaps you are gravitating towards that part of Torah because your soul knows that this is the part of Torah that you have yet to earn. This is the missing puzzle piece. And that's why you're drawn to it. That might be the part of Torah that you're missing in order to complete your mission. And therefore, says the Talmud, you should study what your heart desires. That may be what you are lacking. But more broadly, whatever it is that a person needs to accomplish in their next lifetime, they're going to be positioned, they're going to be created with the ability to accomplish what they need to accomplish. The circumstances of their new life, round two or round 10, whatever it is, the circumstances are being tailored and designed to facilitate them fulfilling their mission. So we see a very unequal distribution of circumstances in in our lives. Some people are very talented in certain areas or are raised in certain ways 
that enable them to do certain things that other people cannot do. Everyone's built differently. One of the reasons that it is such is because everyone has a different mission to accomplish and their circumstances of their lives are going to be tailored, are going to be designed to enable and facilitate them to accomplish what they need to accomplish. So just as an example, one of the examples that our sages bring, some people, they're here because they have to cleanse. They have to be purged of some damage. One of the ways that is done, as we mentioned earlier, is via punishment. If someone sinned in one area, that creates a blemish in their soul in that area. And if they're brought back and they're punished in that area, that perhaps may provide cleansing. So the sages say, and of course this is not an easy thing for us to accept. Maybe the whole subject is hard for us to accept. But this is what the sources say. People born with deformities, people lacking organs or limbs or blind or deaf, God forbid, that may be a result of what happened in last go-round. There was some sort of flaw attributed or associated with that part of their soul and consequently they're going to be punished and thereby cleansed by coming back a second time and being punished in that specific way and thus when they emerge after that second round, their soul has been rectified. It's important to note In this context, someone sins in a specific area. They're going to be punished in the next round in that area in order to fix their soul. But they're not going to be punished in the current round. So if someone does a sin, someone creates a certain damage to their soul in one area, it doesn't work that in their current lifetime, they're going to be punished for that in order to be cleansed for that. And the answer, the reason why, is because that would destroy free will. If someone does a sin in one area and boom, they lose a limb, boom, they're punished in a direct way attributable to what they did, then the whole system is destroyed. There's no free will. Instead, someone's brought back a second time And all of us are ignorant as to the identity of that soul from last go-round. And when we see why things are so different for such different people, we have no idea why. It's all a mystery to us. And free will is preserved. And that person is now enabled to ultimately achieve the ultimate reward. They have a chance. They have a shot at Olam Abba. The Chavetz Chaim, for example, writes... If there was a wealthy person who in lifetime one or previous lifetime, whatever number that may have been, they failed to give charity. That creates a blemish in their soul. They're going to come back this time as a poor person, as a pauper, and that's going to rectify their previous lifetime. Similarly, if there are imbalances between individuals, those scores are going to be settled in an upcoming lifetime. Those accounts are going to be balanced. Someone, God forbid, steals money from another person. There's an imbalance. Person A owes person B money. These people may be brought back to make restitution. That's why we are trained to be extra fastidious in money matters, not to take a nickel that we don't own. We don't want to come back for such trivialties. The Gon of Vilna, in his commentary to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 25, he adds something else. Person A steals from person B 
and they both die before there was a resolution, a restitution, not only does person A have to come back, person B has to come back as well. And therefore, not only don't we want to owe someone money, we don't want anyone to owe us money. And that's why, in fact, there is a widespread custom. If you know someone wronged you, you don't know who that person is, or you know someone owes you money, but there's no way of you getting back that money, you should forgive them because you don't want to come back for this either. But again, the larger idea is that people are coming back for a certain purpose and the circumstances of their lives are going to be tailored to best position them to achieve the goal of their reincarnation. As we mentioned earlier, someone who has a penchant, who has an attraction to a certain mitzvah, to a certain portion of Torah, that may be an indication that that's what they're here to do. And by the way, Someone who is here for a positive reason, they're not going to be given the same Yetzar Hara as someone who is sent back to overcome the bad. If you're sent here to accomplish something positive, that's what you need to do. That's your focus. You're not going to be given astronomy of Yetzar Hara as the person who is going to be sent to overcome the bad. Someone who is here to cleanse the damage, they may feel a preternatural draw to a certain sin, and that may be an indication that that sin is really what they're here for, to overcome that, to fix it, and to restore the soul's pristine purity. But this is why everyone has different tests. It's all designed and engineered and tailored to create the possibility that a person will arrive at their perfection and become eligible for the ultimate, which is Olam Haba. Now, the Gona Vilna, in his work, Evan Shlema 3.5, he applies the idea of reincarnation to a major problem that we have, and this maybe was obvious from what we said so far. When someone is a complete tzaddik, Complete tzaddik, completely righteous. Yet we see them suffering in some way. That, of course, raises the question, tzaddik viralo, a tzaddik, a righteous person, it's bad for them. Bad things are happening to good people. The reason, or at least one of the answers, is because we don't know what that person really is. We don't know the totality of that person's docket of their standing? We don't know. They may be completely perfect in their life today, but perhaps the circumstances of their life today are really governed by what they did in a previous lifetime that we have no idea of what that lifetime may be. And he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says, Life, children, sustenance, does not depend on a person's merit, but on a person's mazel. And mazel means like destiny or or karma, which he interprets to mean that that is what a person needs to accomplish in their lifetime based upon what is still left over from their previous lifetime. So we know why reincarnation may be appropriate for a soul. We understand now how the life of people is going to be designed to enable them to accomplish their goal. Let's take this a little bit, a little bit further. You know, we may think this idea is so spooky. It's too fantastic. It doesn't sound real. But if you break it down to its critical point, if you think about it, It's actually a very logical idea. We have a marriage. The soul, the eternal soul, placed in the ephemeral body. After the body dies, we accept that the soul doesn't die. It goes up. 
and it experiences what it experiences. What prevents the soul from residing in various bodies? We mentioned in the past that our sages compare the soul to really the person and the body to the garment of the person. The body is, is the garment of the soul. That's why the, the body is going to match the soul. The soul has 613 parts. The body do, we mentioned last week, has 613 parts. If you walk into your closet, you can see two cardigans that both fit your body. We have no problem with that. Why? Because this is me, this is my body, and I wear this shirt or that sweater or that coat or that garment. Your single soul can wear, can be hosted by multiple bodies. That's the basic idea, and really, it makes a lot of sense. Now, the notion of reincarnation is also very philosophically helpful. It resolves all kinds of questions, and it helps us live in a more mindful and appropriate fashion. So we already mentioned, bad things happening to good people, the seeming chaos. The inputs don't seem to match the outputs. All that that we see in our world can all be a result of the previous lifetimes. We just read in the Parsha, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. When a person has chet mishpat maves vehumas, when a person has a sin of a judgment of death and they die, you hang it on a tree. That's what the verse says. The Kabbalists tell us that a soul is comparable to a tree. And the word chet, which means sin, has another meaning in Hebrew, and that refers to a lacking, an absence. And thus the Kabbalists read this verse, when a man, when a person has an absence of a judgment of death, there's nothing that you could find in their lifetime that could justify their treatment. Vitalisa oso al eitz. You should attribute it to the tree. You should attribute what's happened to them in their lifetime to the tree to their soul, yes, in this body, in this lifetime, in this iteration, they may be completely righteous. What happened in a previous lifetime to that same soul is beyond us, and that may be why the person was was punished. So the whole notion of, of bad things and why the Almighty does what he does, the suffering of the innocent, the suffering of children, deformities, things that are inexplicable to us, they perhaps may be the result of reincarnation. There were parents of a child who, like good Jewish parents, circumcised the child at eight days, and the child bled out and died. And they came to Arizal, and he told them, he says, this soul belonged to a completely righteous tzaddik in a previous lifetime who was missing just one thing. He was not circumcised. Now, why would a tzaddik not be circumcised? Because of hemophilia. In an instance where multiple brothers of a boy died due to circumcision, we don't circumcise the subsequent one because they may suffer from hemophilia. They don't clot. And therefore, this child, this soul, lacked only one thing, and now the soul was brought to completion. Of course, we cannot make those assessments. We cannot do those speculations. We have no idea. But the Arizal, he was able to see these things. God forbid, someone's born with severe impairments, of whatever kind. They may have a limited ability to interact, to interface with the world. The realm of free will that they're granted may be very narrow. And that may be because they're here to do one specific thing. They have a narrower life mission. When the justice system does you wrong, 
you know that you're innocent. And the court rules, you got to pay. You should be happy, our sages tell us, because who knows, this may be a restitution from a previous lifetime. Incidentally, the Zohar, the beginning of Parshas Mishpatim, in the book of Exodus, where it talks all about civil law. Civil law. Monetary cases between various litigants. He writes a cryptic line. This is the system of reincarnation. One of the means via which scores are settled is via a court ruling incorrectly, incorrectly in this lifetime, but maybe correctly from a previous lifetime. Moreover, believing in reincarnation, understanding this idea, our sages tell us it has other benefits. It helps a person live more mindfully, more carefully. Once you learn more about reincarnation, and once you discover that the agony of reincarnation is way worse than Gehenom, more about that in a second, perhaps you'll live your life with an effort to try to avoid that fate. Moreover, if you realize, if you recognize that there's something that you're missing, and you don't know what it, what it is, you don't know which mitzvah you're missing, you don't know which part of Torah you're missing, that perhaps can be used to motivate a person to try to accomplish that perfection. And because we don't know exactly what is our precise mission, if we take it really seriously, we will pursue all the mitzvos and all of Torah with dogged determination. That's a very good thing because we'll be uplifted. I want to take it now a step deeper. So we learned about why there would be reincarnation. We learned about how a person's life is going to be designed to fulfill their life task. We learned about the various philosophical and spiritual benefits of knowledge of this subject. Let's go a little bit deeper. We talk about the soul coming back. You may recall that we had spoken at length about the various different components of the soul, different layers of the soul. There's the nefesh, the ruach, the neshama, the chaya, the echida. Five different names for the soul, five five different souls that are linked together in this spiritual concatenation. But the truth is, just saying that the soul is comprised of five parts, that's an oversimplification. It breaks down to more granular, fractal levels. Within each component of the soul, the nefesh, the ruach, the neshama, the chay, the yichida, there are subcomponents. Each one of these five parts has its own five parts, and so on, continuing to smaller dimensions. And that's on one level. Moreover, we spoke about this last time, and... Today, we learned how the soul is actually comprised of 613 parts. And the sources tell us that each one of those 613 parts is comprised of 613 parts of its own. Sparks of soul. When we talk about the soul coming back, what's coming back? Is it all of it? Is it some of it? Is it a little sparklet? That's already an advanced and complicated question. And it's not so easy to answer. And it may be different for every person. But a good angle to parse this subject is asking the question a little bit differently. Not asking which part of our soul is coming back next time, but asking which part of our soul do we even have within us right now? And the truth is, unless a person is completely righteous, it's quite likely that they only have a small part of the lowest level of the soul within them. Our sages tell us the body is a garment 
for the soul. But from the soul's perspective, the garment that the body serves is like shoes. You know, what percentage of your body is contained in the shoes? I guess it might depend the size of the shoes, right? If it's boots, maybe it's more. If it's sandals, it's very little. But regardless, only a small percentage of your body is inside your shoes. The soul is like that as well. There's only a small part of our soul that's actually harbored within our body. Maybe a little sparklet of our soul. And for us to access more levels of our soul, to unlock more levels of our soul, we have to first perfect what we have within us. So you may start with the lowest of the lowest of the levels, and then you could progress and unlock higher levels of your soul. We start off with the maybe the nefesh of the nefesh, which is the lowest level of the lowest level. And maybe we could work our way up and advance, and unlock more and more of our soul, compress, so to speak, more of our soul into our body. When it comes to reincarnation, it's a very complicated question. But for our purposes, we can say that we cannot assume that the entirety of the soul is reinserted into the new body. It could be just a small sparklet of the soul. It could be a partial soul. And the way I read the literature, it's also possible for various sparklets of the soul to exist concurrently in different bodies. So if we think of the soul as, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, millions of parts, Maybe it's possible that it's not only one part of this soul addressed at one time. Perhaps there are different bodies, so to speak, with different parts of the same soul. Now, speaking of those bodies, what is the nature of the new bodies? We talk about the nature of the soul. What part of the soul? It's a very complicated question. But what's the nature of the new body, the new host? What does this soul come into? So, of course, we assume that the soul of the human comes back into another human. And while that is true, part of the subject of reincarnation is the soul of human coming into new human, new body of a person. Reincarnation can also be the soul of the human or part of the soul of the human coming back as an animal or in an animal or in a plant or even within inanimate objects. And, of course, interestingly, that tells us that there are different ways via which a person is afforded a second chance. If the person, if the soul comes into a new human, then that new human has free will to some extent. If the soul comes into a rock or a plant or an animal, that is a second chance to achieve perfection via reincarnation, but absent free will. And of course, depending on what the soul needs to be rectified, what's the nature, what's the degree of the cleansing that's needed, that's going to determine into what the person will come back as. Our sources tell us, for example, someone who speaks Lashon Hara will come back as a barking dog. Part of the rectification process for that sin, for that corruption of the soul, is to come back inside a barking dog. And there's a famous and very well-documented story about the Gona Vilna. And it's attributed in the works of the Chafetz Chaim exactly back to the original source. During his self-imposed exile, he was taking a wagon 
He had a Jewish wagon driver. And the driver fell asleep. And the horse veered off the path and started to trample some some beds of vegetation on a field on the side of the road. And the owner of, of said field came and runs and sees this wagon. And he sees that there's one person sleeping and one person studying in a book. So he thought the person studying the book, i.e. the Gona Vilna, he's the owner. And he started beating him up. And of course, his instinct was to say, no, I'm not the, not the owner, I'm just a passenger. He's the guy. But he overcame. And later on, he said, had I not overcome and had I told this person, this field owner, that this person is the guilty party, all my Torah, all my mitzvot, all my merits would not have helped me. I would have come back in some capacity for some time as a barking dog. Someone who steals from another person may come back as a horse. A horse that does work for that person. I read a wild story about the Baal Shem Tov. This story is less well documented than the one about the Gona Vilna. He was visiting someone in his travels. And the owner showed him a really mighty horse, small but strong. And the Baal Shem Tov said, well, give me this horse. I want this horse. Not, ah, I can't give you this horse. He's so strong. He's able to pull three times his weight. Later on, the Baal Shem Tov said to this homeowner, horse owner, I want to see your, I want to see your documents. Show me your, who owes you money? And he found a certain loan. And he said, this person, is this person alive? No, he's dead. Okay, so do you need this loan? Could you forgive this loan? Because the person's anyhow dead. He says, sure. Ripped it up. They went back to the stable and the horse was dead. Why? The Baal Shem Tov, the story goes, was able to identify that there was a sparklet of this person inside the horse made, making restitution for the person that he owed money to. Once the person forgive the loan, the horse can go back or the person can go back home. So a person can come back as an animal, or as a plant, or as an inanimate object, other food stuffs. In such an instance, one way for the person to be rectified would be to have a mitzvah done with it. If there is a sparklet of a human soul inside a food item, and another human makes a blessing and has the proper intentions... That can elevate the sparks of the whatever part of the human soul is trapped inside the food, and that can usher that person towards their perfection. And if that food is, by the way, eaten without a mitzvah, it can, in fact, be harmful for whatever parts of the soul are trapped within it. I also read another cute story with the Arizal. He was studying with his students in northern Israel. And a goat hopped next to them. And the Arizal was able to communicate with this goat and to identify the soul that's within it. And to know what that soul needs to arrive at his rectification. And he instructed the students to buy the animal and to slaughter it with precise intentions. And they ate the meat of that goat on Shabbos. And that brought that soul to perfection. So a person, a soul, a human soul may come back as a non-human in some capacity for some time. And that, by the way, is not a rarity. In fact, it's the norm. The sources maintain that almost everyone needs some version of this rectification. And it's not a pleasant experience at all. Coming back as another human is really unpleasant. But to have a human soul, even if it's just a spark of a human soul, to have that constricted in a non-human, in a rock, in a tree, in a plant, in an animal, that is quite excruciating, but it provides cleansing. 
And there's another frightening point, and that is that there's a big difference between reincarnation into another human versus reincarnation into a non-human. If a human soul is reincarnated into a second human, or a tenth, or a fiftieth, the person's consciousness is unaware of its previous self. We're assuming that most of us are repeats. We have no idea. We don't remember at all about who we were, our previous standing, our previous self. By contrast, if a human soul is reincarnated into a non-human, that soul is acutely aware of its previous stature and glory. I used to be important. I used to be someone. Now I'm trapped in an animal, in a plant, in a rock. It's awful, but it cleanses, which is the ultimate goal. Now, there are different types of reincarnation talking about now in another human. What we would call standard reincarnation is the reinsertion of a soul into a new human host, human body host, for a full lifetime. In that instance, this person, this new person, all of their deeds affect the soul. The mitzvot improve the soul, the sins, they damage the soul. All that accrues to the original soul. That's the standard reincarnation. Then there's something called double reincarnation. And that is when there are multiple souls bound together for a full lifetime. And again, the details of this are vast and intricate, and I don't know anything about it. This is what I know. I'm I'm sharing with you what I know. You could have multiple souls in a single human body for a full lifetime. These souls are bound together for the full lifetime, and they suffer the consequences and earn the benefits together. And then there's what's called pregnant reincarnation. And that's when two or maybe even more souls can coexist simultaneously within a body for a temporary amount of time. And of course, it's called pregnant reincarnation. Just like a pregnancy, there's this temporary time period when there are multiple people within one body. Similarly, that can exist in a reincarnation form. In this instance, the visiting soul will have a much weaker connection to the body. And therefore, it will not be subject to the sins of the body. It will only benefit from the mitzvahs of the body. And based upon my reading of the sources, this can even happen in the lifetime of the visiting soul. One person's alive, their soul or part of their soul, a spark of their soul, can go visit some other person, spend some time with that soul, maybe go back. That is called pregnant reincarnation. And there are two reasons why a pregnant reincarnation would happen. Number one, for the benefit of the host soul. So we have the original person, body and soul, and they're visited by a second soul for a temporary amount of time. And that's for the benefit of the host soul. And the host soul will benefit because the visiting soul would give a boost, would push them over the top in whatever agenda they have. They want to do a mitzvah. They want to overcome a sin. And they really want to do it. The Talmud tells us, Habal attire, someone who wants to purify themselves, Messiah Oso, is aided. Kabbalistically, that means that souls, other souls, are going to come within him and give him the extra spiritual boost to be able to overcome or to accomplish. So as an example of this, I read that when Joseph had his fateful test 
with a wife of Potiphar, with Miss Potiphar, the soul of Isaac, who, by the way, was alive at the time, or part of the soul of Isaac, came into his body and gave him the extra boost, again, for the benefit of the host soul, he got the boost that he needed to overcome this test. So that's one reason why pregnant reincarnation would happen, for the benefit of the host soul. A second reason would be for the benefit of the visiting soul. A person is about to do a mitzvah. Let's assume it's a rare mitzvah, either because it doesn't happen very often or because the person's going to do it with tremendous motivation and intention and devotion. The visiting soul or souls may come hitch a ride with the person with the original soul about to do said mitzvah and thereby achieve the benefit of reincarnation in an accelerated fashion. So you have a soul. It's perfect. It needs one mitzvah. Instead of sending it back down for a full-blown reincarnation, this soul may just come and visit temporarily, join a host who's about to do that mitzvah, and that mitzvah will benefit both souls. Now, as we mentioned earlier, unlike the other forms of reincarnation, in this instance, where it's like we called it pregnant reincarnation, the visiting soul is only partner to the mitzvos, not to the sins of the person that it is visiting. And it has a much weaker association with the host. It doesn't feel any pain or suffering of the host. Now, this is not all that there is. There are other types, but that's the, again, the contours of this subject. Now, what is reincarnation like? So, from all that we know, it's very unpleasant. You will recall coming to this world for the soul just without the whole subject of reincarnation, the soul from heaven on high. Coming to this world, it's very unnatural. The soul protests. In the words of the Midrash, it's like the soul is chucked into the raging sea from atop the ship deck. It was on the ship deck. It was safe. It was close to the captain. And now it is struggling for life. That's the experience of the soul coming even once. When it was here, it was in the water. It's safe now. It's thrown back in again. It's quite painful. I read an analogy, which I really liked. There were some people living on the 70th floor of a skyscraper. And one day the elevators weren't working. So they had no choice but to trudge up the steps, sweating and panting. They get to the top only to discover that they left the keys in the lobby. Then have to go all the way back down, get those keys, and come back up. It's not pleasant at all. And as we mentioned earlier, it also carries risk. You're sent back down with the opportunity to achieve the perfection that is so coveted. But the opposite can happen. There could be more corruption. Gehenna, it's only a positive. Just cleansing. Reincarnation carries the risk of further sullying. And that's why, sometimes, if a person just needs to do one mitzvah, they do that, they accomplish it, they're going to be, thanks to the goodness, benevolence of the Almighty, they're going to be swiftly extracted from this world. And I guess to us, we're totally ignorant to the whole thing. We have no idea what the person needs to do. And we ask questions. But if you think about it from the perspective of reincarnation and the soul, to be here is a risk. If you only need to do one thing, you do it. It is to your benefit to be removed and to remove the risk of further corruption. And maybe there's extra cleansing that can be achieved in Gehenom. Or you'd prefer that than to be here with all the risks entailed. Now, there's some discussion amongst the sources about how many times a soul can return. 
There is an idea found in many sources that it's capped at four times. You don't have infinite chances. Others say that no, so long as the soul is improving, it will be given as many opportunities as needed. But regardless, the ultimate status of the soul in heaven, in paradise, in Olam Abba, that's going to depend on how long and how arduous was the process to arrive at the perfection. I want to remind you that what we cover today, even though it's really a snapshot of the whole subject, it's a fraction of the material. There is truly intricate, detailed treatment of this subject. We just scratched the surface. We tried to cover the broad strokes of the subject, what it's about, how it fits in to the general timeline of what happens after you die and how it helps round out our understanding of principle number 11, reward and punishment. But we can never sign off before we address the question that's raised every time this subject is discussed. And that is, which one is my body? Which one's my body? The soul I know. It's my soul. Which one's my body? And after resurrection which, by the way, is the 13th of 13 principles, please God, we'll get to. After resurrection, which body is going to be matched with the soul? It's a question that's asked every time we talk about this. And I always like to remind people that this question presupposes that in one lifetime you have one body. The only problem is, well, if you have multiple lifetimes, you have multiple bodies, which one is yours? But the truth is, even in one lifetime, we don't have the same body. Every second, there are millions of cells that are changing within you. Old ones are being removed. New ones are being created. On a molecular level, your body's not the same that it was yesterday or when we started. So that's, I think, important to address at the top of this question. But I think taking it to the next step, if the body is a garment for the soul, just like your your closet, like we mentioned earlier, can have multiple sweaters, perhaps the soul can have many bodies. Perhaps your ultimate body is going to be a composite of the many, many bodies that you had. Or perhaps it's going to be the first one, which is the original. Or perhaps it's the last one. That's the one in which perfection was achieved. Arizal addresses this question. Those were all my speculations in the past. Arizal addresses this question. In Olam Abba, after resurrection, that's when you have Perfection. Your soul may have had a very long line of bodies, of hosts, of garments, of cardigans in which it ultimately achieved that perfection. Every body is going to be resurrected with the portion of soul that earned completion within it. So let's just say for argument's sake, a person was really righteous. It took him only two rounds to arrive at perfection. In the first round, they achieved 99% of their mission. The second round, they completed it. The final touches of their perfection were achieved in the second body. When that person is resurrected, those two bodies will each harbor the portion of their soul in which they earned perfection, respectively. The first body will have 99% of the soul, and that last percent, that last spark, will be completed, will be featured in the second body. Now, I don't know if this is an exclusive take, but I did see that the Arizal does mention this idea in his writings. To wrap up here, I want to 
talk about some of the miscellaneous ideas or odds and ends about reincarnation theories, speculation, examples from the literature. Part of the Shar Hadil Dulim, which is the book that we mentioned earlier, the comprehensive book on this subject, talks about the Arizal and his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital. And he reveals to him the many dozens of former lives that this person, that his student had. In his writing, he also mentions part of your soul or some aspect of your soul is associated with Rabbi Akiva. And that explains why Rabbi Chaim Vital was terrified when he saw Gentiles. He became terrorized. And the explanation that was given, because the Romans, the Romans flayed Rabbi Akiva alive. And here's the insight. Some of those phobias carried over. Which I found to be very interesting. This may in fact explain why certain people are terrified of certain things. People, maybe if someone died while they drowned, that fear of water is going to carry over. Someone, God forbid, was burned alive, may have phobias about fire. People who are unnaturally afraid of constricted spaces, they're very claustrophobic. Who knows what they experienced in the previous lifetime. Someone who's scared of heights, People who are revolted by blood. It's so interesting that people, you know, we're ostensibly a a uniform species. Everyone has these little terrors that they're scared of, while other people just don't have that. I give an example. Like I'm I'm terrified of I, I can't if I see blood, I have to lay down or else I'm gonna I'm gonna faint. Some people are like that. Even when my my boys by the brisk me, I couldn't look. I can't, I can't stand the sight. Who knows what that reveals? You see other people, it doesn't bother them at all. Incidentally, Arizal reveals to Rabbi Chaim Vital that in one of his previous lifetimes, he was a mohel, he was a ritual circumciser, and he wasn't well trained, and he did a circumcision that resulted in the death of the baby, and that's why you're scared of blood, and you should never do circumcision, and you should never even slaughter an animal. And you shouldn't even make sure that even a bug, you don't, shouldn't kill even a bug. And that's part of your rectification. But he says that's why he was so scared of blood. I have a theory, totally speculation, why many Torah observant Jews today are terrified of dogs. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Terrified of dogs. And you have people, again, Jews of various different types. And most people love dogs, love to play with dogs. And then you have, it's almost uniform, that the Torah observant community, they're terrified of dogs. So here's the theory. Just recently, we had the worst genocide in history. Of course, I'm talking about the Holocaust. If someone was killed because they're Jewish, they are given a straight ticket, straight ticket to heaven. No questions asked. Do not pass go, go straight. Full access to paradise. The problem is they get to paradise. And we'll learn more about what paradise is like. Please doubt upcoming, because as you remember, we said paradise is similar to Olam Abba, the experience of paradise. But it's a very spiritual pleasure. And what happens to all the Holocaust victims who are given a straight ticket to heaven, but because they never trained themselves to appreciate spiritual pleasure, they were ignorant in matters of Torah, they were not able to enjoy it. They were not able to experience it. So they begged the heavenly tribunals, send us back as 
Torah-observant Jews, so that way we can develop a taste for matters of the spiritual, and we can become educated in matters of Torah, immerse us in Torah. That way, when we come back, we'll be given, again, straight access, and we'll finally have the tools to be able to appreciate it. But they come back with some vestiges some phobias of their previous life. And maybe, and I read some of the literature on this, maybe that's why they're so terrified of dogs. I'd had someone, I might have mentioned this in a podcast, I had someone that told me that they cannot handle constricted spaces. And their theory is that in the Holocaust, their previous soul, or the previous lifetime, they were, may have been in one of the train cars, or maybe they were hiding in some sort of, some sort of uh, hiding place. And that's how they died. And that's why they just have this terror. They have this terror. They always need to know what exit is. And they always need to know. They always have to have their space. Again, it's, a lot of it's speculation, but there's certainly the, the principal idea that some of the aspects of your previous lifetime are carried over to your new lifetime. It's also been suggested, I think it's also been implemented actually, that some elements of your previous lifetime can be resurfaced through hypnosis. But again, I don't know anything about that. There is a lot of literature about you know, language. How does someone know this language? And they, they, how do they know information about places and people? There is at least some evidence or some speculation that certain bits of knowledge or bits of vestiges of the previous life do slip through the cracks and are present in the upcoming lifetime. Just a few more cool themes. The book of Numbers begins with a counting of the Jewish people. And Moshe counted together with the heads of the tribe, together with Aaron, all the Jewish males. But the verse says, call Zachar Ligul Gilosam, which means literally every male according to their skull. Gul Gilosam, their skull. The Kabbalists tell us that the Hebrew word for reincarnation is Gilgul. And we know just like the, the skull is kind of cylindrical, it's kind of round, it's kind of spherical. The term reincarnation means to roll, the soul rolls back. And the Kabbalists say that when Moshe was counting and evaluating every individual, he wasn't just looking at them in their current lifetime, he was counting them, he was able to foresee all the reincarnations of every Jew. And some of the Kabbalists add, that the majority of reincarnations are males, whereas only a minority of females are reincarnated. That's what the Arizal said. And that would explain perhaps what Moshe was counting in this verse. This is verse 2 of the whole book of Numbers. Call Zachar, every male, le gul gilosam. Another interesting idea that Moshe is able to foresee, again, this is not featured overtly in the non-Kabbalistic literature, but it's kind of hinted to, at least the way the Kabbalists read it, they're most able to foresee all the future lifetimes, future iterations of every soul of the Jewish people. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can't do this. We have no idea what is the backstory of our soul. We cannot say this person comes from that person. We, we, we don't know anything about this. But the Arizal and the other Kabbalists, they revealed hundreds of historical examples of reincarnation. And they would show the similarities throughout both lifetimes, the similarities and how the second lifetime may be a rectification for the first lifetime. As I mentioned earlier, the Arizal revealed to his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, a comprehensive account of all of the different souls that he was associated with, and again, it's dozens and dozens. Just a quick sampling 
of what the sages say. So, for example, Cain and Abel. There's a lot of literature in the Kabbalistic books about Cain and Abel. They came back, we're told, as Moshe and Jethro. And who Joseph came back as. And Rabbi Kiva, there's a lot of literature about Rabbi Kiva. In some, Rabbi Kiva may have emanated from Zimri, who was the head of the tribe of Shimon. And one of Rabbi Kiva's wives may in fact be Cosby, who was the princess that this Zimri was with. And that's a rectification of what happened initially. Again, very advanced ideas. I don't want to go through all of them that I have in my notes over here. But there are some very cool things. Maybe this is something that we shouldn't even talk about. But I'll tell you something really cool. This this we'll share. The Talmud talks about a pious individual who was always very fastidious about guarding Shabbos. Very fastidious. We made sure that he never violated the Shabbos. And a miracle happened to him, and a tzlaf tree, kind of tree, grew in his property, and he got a lot of money out of it. Arizal reveals that this individual, this pious individual, is Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi, one of the sages of the Mishnah, and he was a reincarnation of Tzlavchad, Tzlavchad, who appears in the book of Numbers, who has the five daughters and no sons. And Tzlavchad, we're told, he is the Mikoshesh, he's the one who's gathering the twigs on Shabbos, who was executed in the book of Numbers. I believe it's chapter 14 or chapter 15. And the reason why he was executed is because he violated the Shabbos. And therefore he came back as this great rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda bar who was very fastidious about keeping Shabbos. And that's hinted to when he received the reward. It was a slough tree. And the way you would say one slough tree, you would say tzlaf chad, chad is one. And that's hinted to, this is none other than tzlaf chad, the individual tzlaf chad. And the tree is the tzlaf tree, and it's one tzlaf tree, so it's tzlaf chad, one tzlaf tree, and that is hinting that this is the reincarnation of tzlaf chad. And elsewhere in the Talmud, we're told that this great rabbi was an exemplar of honoring Shabbos. And this idea was shared to me by my friend, Rabbi Yosef Nachamavitz, who lives over here. He pointed out that elsewhere in the Talmud, the Talmud talks about how he would wash his hands and his feet and his face and wear his talus, his garment, and waiting for Shabbos. And that's also connected to Tzlavchad and the person who's gathering tweets on Shabbos. Because the Midrash tells us that the Almighty told Moshe that the reason why this individual violated the Shabbos is because throughout the week they wear their tefillin. And tefillin reminds a person to observe the mitzvos. But in Shabbos we don't wear a tefillin. And that's why he had no reminders. And therefore the Almighty says, let them wear a tzitzis, let them wear a talus. And if you look in chapter 15, of the book of Numbers, right after the episode of this Mikoshis, this person who violated the Shabbos, who we know is Slavchad, we have the, right away the next Torah section is about wearing tzitzis. And thus the Talmud tells us that Rabbi Yudah Bar Eloi, he would always wait for Shabbos, fixing the violation of his soul in the previous realm, previous lifetime, and he would don his talus, he would wear his talus to, again, remind himself about the importance of Shabbos. And the coolest part of this, if you look at the gematria of Tzlafchad ben Hefer, the full name of Tzlafchad, it's the exact gematria of Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi, the son of Eloi. Again, it's just, this is one, again, of hundreds of examples where we see two people in very different eras 
And of course, we cannot trace the provenance of the soul. We have no idea, but the sages do it. And when we see that, it's kind of mind-boggling and mind-blowing and uh, and very dramatic. So to recap, we've learned, I think, a lot about the subject of reincarnation. We went a little bit longer than we typically do because I wanted to get it all done in one sitting. You've heard my disclaimers. I don't really know much about it. There's a lot here. This is what I read. But we've certainly seen how sensual it is in our lifetimes. The majority of us, we're reliably told, are not first-timers. In the Almighty's benevolence, he created more opportunities for souls to achieve perfection. Beyond Gehenim, there's reincarnation in its various forms, various contexts. It can give a person a second chance to accomplish what they missed in the first go-round, positive sense and the negative sense. It can provide an arena for them to be cleansed from their blemishes, perhaps via punishment. Maybe they can be sent down to help others. I think it's a very useful subject. It helps us live life more mindfully with the recognition that there's something, there's a mission that we need to accomplish. But truthfully, it's a gift from the Almighty to expand the pool of candidates for Olam Abba. We could come back for a bevy of reasons, in a bevy of forms, and we're given more and more chances to arrive at the ultimate destination, which is Olam Abba. And it's also the subject that we will dig our teeth into next. I think that we are finally ready. As always, my email address is rabbiwalbeatgmail.com from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I say thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.